What happens when your worst fear becomes your reality? Hi, I'm Brent Cassidy. Welcome to the Nightmare Success In and Out podcast, where we explore how to overcome your fears and nightmares to set yourself free. We're going to be exploring this topic with guys I was in Leavenworth with and others who served in other prisons. We're going to be talking about life before prison, life in prison, and life out of prison. These stories can be inspiring, sometimes sad. There's some humor, but hopefully you can come away with a nugget of something that will help you knock down some of the prisons you've built up in your own mind. Folks, today I'm, I've been really excited about this interview. I've got uh, Jeff Smith with me. Jeff, welcome. Jeff's in his car right now driving, so uh, he's, he's a man on the move. Jeff, welcome in. Hey, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to, uh, to talk with you. So I was just going to, I want to give everybody a little bit of background, Jeff. I mean, he, speaking of, it's, it's probably appropriate that he is driving because he is a man on the move, but his background, I think is pretty, uh, I'd say the word impressive wouldn't be overused here. This is a guy that, uh, didn't come from money, but he, he, uh, he got himself a master's PhD, political science, which I'm a, I'm a fellow political. I think we've had more political science people on here than there are in the country. But uh, from WashU, uh, he co-founded Confluence Charter Schools in St. Louis City and now has over 4,000 students. I think that's unreal. Uh, he ran for an open congressional seat of, of Gephardt's, uh, a guy that ran for president in 2004, and he only lost by – you know, was it less than 1%, 1,700 votes. That actually spawned a documentary film titled, Can Mr. Smith Get to Washington Anymore? He was elected Missouri State Senator. He did a TED Talk. How many of us would like to one day dream to do a TED Talk? TED Talk was uh, titled Lessons in Business from Prison. He's the author of the book, Mr. Smith Goes to Prison. And uh, it's just, I, I've, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more, Jeff, about what you're doing, you know, today, but uh, in life out of prison, but um, very impressive, very impressive, my man. Well, thank you. Thank you. I mean, you know, I had a ton of help along the way from, from a lot of people. Um, my campaigns were successful primarily because of like all the young people that helped on them. I had, you know, over 600 volunteers on my first campaign, uh, a lot of whom were my former students uh, from Wash U and other places where I taught. So, you know, as you know, from being successful in business, everything is a team effort. And, yeah. you know, you can only really get anywhere if, if you have uh, people growing in the same direction. It's just uh, amazingly talented young people, uh, none of whom were ever qualified for the jobs I hired them to do. Because yeah. I've always thought that uh, it's less important what people have on paper and more important their drive, their, you know, their character, their integrity, uh, and their passion. And so I always hired people, you know, based on their, you know, their energy and, and, and their dynamism more than anything that they've done in the past. And that tended to serve me well. Yeah, and I think that's a huge tip right there is passion can take somebody a long ways because it usually means that they're going to be in the right mindset to do what it takes to get to where they want to go. Uh, and you you can't teach passion. They have to feel it. And that's that's something, you know, if you're trying to build a team, if you get a whole bunch of passionate people, you can get a lot accomplished. Uh, you know, Grant, Jeff, we're, we're, both, we're both former basketball players. That's right. That's yeah, right. But, one of the things that I heard from uh, coaches, this is probably nothing that you ever heard, but uh, I heard from a coach one time, he said, man, you know, I would, um, I would love to, uh, you know, so I was, I played in high school and had a, had a decent high school career. And then I went on and um, was uh, at the University of North Carolina and I was uh, trying out for the JV team uh, there. And, uh, and the coach said to me, you know, you got a hell of a, a hell of a game. You're a great ball handler and passer and, you know, love your defensive in intensity. The problem is you can't teach height. <laughs> uh, and I think it's the same thing, you know, like, like you were saying, when you're hiring, uh, you know, there's lots of ways that you can teach people the specific skills that you need on a job. 
but yeah. there's no way to teach, you know, the kind of, you know, commitment and passion and drive that make people successful. So, and Jeff, I know guys like you, you know, that pesky, pesky little five foot seven, five foot six, five foot eight guy that's all over you and you can't get away from them. And they're taking the ball. They're getting open somehow because you missed you, that you can't find them that I know that guy. Those are those guys that just end up just they're like, get away from me. And then he ends up kind of controlling the game. Like, how did that happen? Well, he just outworked everybody. Uh, Jeff, take me back. I mean, you, and you're growing up as, as Jeff Smith in your neighborhood as a kid, what was life like? What were your parents like? What was, what was going on in your world when you were growing up? It's a good question. So, I had a pretty interesting upbringing in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, in some ways it was typical. We were middle class, you know, uh, and uh, went to, you know, a good public school. So that was all pretty normal. What was a little bit less normal were a couple things. First of all, my dad was obsessed with sports. He had been uh, a college coach and he um, was obsessed with the idea that I was going to be a great basketball player. And I was pretty good, but my dad was five foot six and my mom was five foot two. And they took me to the doctor when I was maybe three years old. And they said, uh, so what's, what's the deal? You know, he's, uh, we're a little concerned about his size. And the doctor said, well, he's in the third percentile in both height and in weight. And my dad said to my mom, well, you know, at least he's not in the first or second percentile. And the doctor said, there's no such thing as the first or second. We don't want, we don't want to make people feel bad. So we started <laughs> at, at three. So I was, I was really little, uh, but my dad, my dad was absolutely determined that he was going to, you know, do everything he could to try to get me to the NBA. And so he would take me, uh, you know, St. Louis, cause you know, you grew up in not too far from where I did, but he would take me to the worst parts of the city and starting when I was, you know, nine, 10 years old. And he would drop me off at like this boys club, Matthews Dickey or this other gym called the wool center. Yeah. And then uh, sometimes he would stay other times he would leave and go play golf and pick me up in three or four hours. <laughs> there. I love and it. So it was sort of trial by fire. I played with the best kids in the city from a very young age. And uh, you know, I was, always the littlest kid, usually the youngest kid, almost always the only white kid on the mm -hmm. court. And, you know, you get better when you play with people who are bigger, stronger, faster, older, uh, all those things. And, and my dad gave me that opportunity to do that. Uh, he never told my mom where he was taking me, of course, because he would have gotten in a lot of trouble. But uh, that's where I spent a lot of my childhood. Jeff, and, don't you think, Jeff, don't you think that the, uh, playing sports like that as a kid and, and mixing it up with, you know, you are accepted because you can play with them and you learn how to play with kids that are older or they might have this or that. But when everybody gets out on the court, everybody creates their own uh, identity and they're accepted because of how they play with others. And, and I think, you know, one of the things I, I take from your book and the things that happen with you uh, that played itself pretty well for you to be in that environment growing up and how you handled things as you got older. Yeah. You know, I think, I think you put it really well. Um, I ended up, uh, well, first of all, for me, like basketball and other sports, but, but mostly basketball became kind of a metaphor for life. Like, you know, as you referenced uh, in the opening, you know, I ran for Congress uh, in an open seat against a guy named Russ Carnahan. Um, for, for the non-Missourians who are listening, his dad was governor, his mom was a U.S. senator, his grandpa was a congressman, his sister was secretary of state, a very well-known family, and of course I was a total nobody. Uh, but when you go out on the basketball court for that many years and you're always, you know, a foot shorter than the guy you're guarding and, yeah. 80, and 80 pounds lighter and you got to figure out a way to do it, it just doesn't seem that daunting to run against the guy <laughs> who happens to have more name ID than you. It's like, look, I know I'm as good as him. I think I'm better than him or I wouldn't be in the race. So I'll figure out a way to do it. So I think basketball uh, really did become a metaphor for my life in, in, in that way. I also think as you suggest, just 
it helped me transcend barriers, barriers that, you know, tend to divide St. Louis in particular, um, and then really the whole country around race. Um, when I ended up uh, going to college, I became a, a black studies major in large part because of the experiences I'd had on the basketball court. Uh, and then going to a high school that accepted kids through a school desegregation program and um, just getting more exposure to, to kids who grew up a lot differently and a lot less fortunate you know, than I was. And so um, from those experiences, when I ended up running uh, for a state Senate district, that was a majority black district, it seemed totally natural to me uh, to try to um, cross the, the racial demarcation line of Del Mar Boulevard, the street that, that bisects St. Louis City, uh, whereby 98% of people who live north of it are black and, and the vast majority of people south of it are white, um, at least on the southwest side of the city. Uh, that did not daunt me in any way. And then, as we'll talk about uh, in the rest of the show, when I ended up in prison, um, again, with you know, a uh, uh, vast majority of, of, of black uh, people in prison, it, it, you know, um, being able to, to mix and fit in um, the, the experiences I'd had as a kid uh, and in college helped, and, and as a state senator representing a very diverse district, helped me um, be at home and fit in in a way that probably most white collar offenders uh, would struggle you know, to do in, in, inside of a federal prison where 99% of people were in for dealing drugs. Yeah, good point. So I, I'm curious, Jeff, did you always have it in the back of your mind that politics could be something that you wanted to get into? You know, I always enjoyed politics. I didn't know I was going to run for office. I wasn't one of those people like Eric Greitens uh, for, for the Missourians out there. You know, they kind of told his grade school teachers he was going to be president someday. I wasn't like that. Um, I, I went into education. I worked in St. Louis public schools. I co-founded charter schools. I, you know, got a PhD at Wash U and I was teaching at, taught at Dartmouth and at Wash U and, and thought I might be a full-time, you know, professor. But then when Dick Gephardt's uh, congressional seat opened up, you know, there were only two people who'd been in that seat during the previous 54 years. So I right. figured if I'm not going to take a shot now when it's an open seat, because it's so hard to beat an incumbent, they have so many advantages when it comes to name recognition, fundraising, connections. That it's hard to beat an incumbent. I figured, hey, the seat's open. I know I'm only 29 years old and I know I'm a total nobody, but why not? Why not try well, it? So I did. Well, I think one of the interesting things that you bring up in your book is, is that you got it started with education basically right out of college and, and uh, you, you, there was, you ran into frustrations of, you know, the, the kids couldn't get their books and nobody really seemed to care that they couldn't get their books. And I, I know that you gave one example that the guy said, well, well, when she gets back from vacation and, you know, vacation was after Thanksgiving, I can't remember how long a period of time that was between when you were asking for those materials and when she's getting back from vacation. But I is, you know, starting and co-founding a school which now has over 4000 kids how how did how did that come about at such a young age for you to get involved with that well um as you put it you know i was pretty frustrated when i worked at st louis public schools because i didn't feel like there was any sense of urgency uh to try to you know help a, a lot of kids certainly i saw some teachers who were amazing um and i saw some principals who who did a fantastic job but I saw more probably who were just punching the clock. And I saw a lot of people at the central office who um, really just didn't seem to evince uh, that much concern for the actual outcomes at the schools, as long as they did enough to keep their jobs. And it was tragic, you know, for almost 50 years now, the results have been pretty abysmal for most St. Louis public school kids. There's a few great schools. I don't want to dismiss them, but the vast majority of kids are not getting a great education. And that's why a minuscule percentage of them, you know, test uh, so poorly on state tests and fail to test proficient. So I was pretty impatient. I couldn't put up with the dysfunction uh, at the central office very long. And I ended up uh, co-founding a charter school because the state of Missouri had just put in a statute enabling uh, citizens to create these totally outside of the, the typical bureaucracy, 
giving you the ability to innovate when it came to curriculum. And, and uh, we wanted to focus in particular on science and math because there is such a paucity of you know, black engineers and scientists uh, around the country. And so um, a lot of parents are voting with their feet and mm -hmm. leaving the traditional public schools and choosing charter schools. For a lot of parents, the regular public schools are a good fit. For others, they should have that choice uh, to do something different. And they shouldn't be, it shouldn't be limited by income. It shouldn't just be that wealthy families get a choice. I think all families should get that choice. So that's how I ended up co-founding Confluence uh, alongside a woman named Dr. Susan Yushitel, who was the uh, executive director of the school desegregation program in the metropolitan area. So she had a lot of experience in the education realm. We were kind of an odd couple. She was 65, I was 25, but we made it work. And, you know, the schools are, uh, you know, have, have uh, really attracted a lot of families, um, uh, over 4,000 kids today. Uh, that's a big deal. And I, the other thing I thought was interesting is you, you took, because of your basketball background and being with different people that you knew, uh, you decided that you were going to start helping some of these kids that probably wouldn't have had the opportunity tutoring them on the ACT. And um, some of those people that you helped not only got to college, but there were a couple that made it into the NBA. And, uh, you know, for that, I guess you just decided, hey, I, I, nobody's doing this. I think I'll step in and, and make this connection and see if I can make these people get to the next step. Well, that's a little complicated, and it probably involves one of my first crimes uh, in, in the world, which uh, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know if you remember that that little nuance uh, <laughs> from the book, but I was teaching at Kaplan, yeah. and, you know, Kaplan, everybody knows, the national test prep company, and I had one kid who was paying half price for the class. He was, you know, poor. He was a basketball star. Um and one of his kind of mentors or kind of, you know, had, had helped give some money so he could at least get, you know, uh, get the money together because he was a division one basketball prospect, but he only had an 11 the first time he took the ACT and you needed an 18 to not be a prop proposition 48 casualty. Uh, otherwise, you know, the NCAA, that means the NCAA would not let you play your freshman year. Mm -hmm. And a lot of big time schools, they don't want to lose somebody for a whole year if they're going to give them a scholarship. So they were mm -hmm. shying away from recruiting anybody who was a quote unquote proposition 48 casualty. So we were trying to get his a ACT score up and we ended up, uh, I did a lot of just one-on-one -on -one tutoring with him. It turns out that even though he had a 3.7 GPA, he could not even really read. And he was such a nice kid. He had so much potential as a basketball player that the teachers at a school were just giving him like B pluses. Just to just, pass. J just when he showed, yeah, just to pass. Uh, and so obviously that was not serving him well in life, even though they thought it was. So, you know, we started out with like Sports Illustrated for kids, just reading articles, sounding out one word at a time and finding some stuff that, he, that interested him, topics that interested him to keep him stimulated. Uh, got him an, an 18 on the ACT. Uh, he worked his, his tail off to get there, uh, played uh, in the Big East and then ended up playing professional basketball for about a decade uh, and is now a high school basketball coach. Um, from that small beginning, um, I did something that was questionable, I, I think probably illegal, <laughs> uh, went ahead and copied all the Kaplan materials and then ran free courses for a St. Louis AAU basketball team uh, and then ended up running it on a at scale you know, just charging like about one tenth of what Kaplan charged, but wanting those families and those kids to have a little bit of skin in the game because yeah. if they're getting something free, I learned after the first couple of times, then they didn't attach any value to it. So uh, ended up helping, you know, lots of kids that be able to go to college and play basketball. And um, yeah, like I said, um, definitely violated uh, copyright law. <laughs> All right. right, modern day Robin Hood right there. That that was a cool <laughs> story though, because well, let's fast forward a little bit because you know you had and you know going into the running for that congressional seat was where Dick Gephardt was vacating, going up against basically you know royalty of of the Carnahan name and and stepping into that. What do you think the toughest thing was, Jeff, to get into a race and run at the age you were and and to make 
what happened happened? I think was the it toughest, money? Uh, the toughest thing um, at that age was just no one taking me seriously. Yeah. You know, I had a, I had pretty good political acumen and pretty good. You still look like you're like 25 years old. So <laughs> you're 48. Yeah, but, you know, I mean, I'm 48 now, and uh, so I look 20 years, you know, younger yeah. uh, than I look now, and I, you know, am I'm small. I was, you know, five foot six. Uh, 115 pounds. By the end of the race, I weighed 102 pounds because I wow. knocked on over 25,000 doors and I would sprint in between the doors. So I would run several miles each day uh, in a suit. Um, so I, I sweat a lot during a St. Louis summer of doing that and I lost a lot of weight. Anyway, the point is when your suit's falling off you and it looks like it's your dad's hand me down uh, and uh, you know, you, you, you look as young as I did, people just, a lot of people dismiss you. You know, what do you think about this? You've never been elected to anything. You look like as my uh, former, um, you know, campaign uh, supporter and, and friend, Steve Brown, who you knew from high school, yeah. uh, said at one point in the documentary about my campaign, he said, you know, you look like you're 12 years old. You sound like you've been castrated and your suit looks like you got it at your animals. <laughs> so, you know, I had an uphill battle just because I didn't look like what people thought a congressman should look like. It yeah. didn't matter that I had a lot, that I had, I think, pretty decent ideas. It didn't yeah. matter that I could articulate them better than, say, Russ Carnahan. To a lot of people, I just didn't look the part. And that's politics. And I get it. You know, yeah. a lot of people don't live and breathe politics the way that I did. They don't spend time researching the platforms of everybody in the race. Instead, they choose their politicians not unlike the way that we choose like our, our soda when you go to the store and you see 7-Up and then you see Super Up. And 7-Up mm -hmm. is like $2 for a, half, for a two liter and Super Up is maybe a dollar and nine. And you see that it probably tastes very similar and it's a dollar cheaper, but you're like, eh, I trust 7-Up. Yeah. I know the name. Yeah. And that's the same way a lot of people vote. They know the name Ashcroft or Carnahan or Clay, these longtime names in St. Louis. Now, that's beginning to change uh, in a lot of places, but residually that effect hurt me in my first race. And um, it didn't help that there were two Smiths in the race and only <laughs> one. So yeah. I guess the, the Smith vote got split up a little bit. Too bad there weren't another couple Carnahans in that race. That would have helped. <laughs> so... You had a really weird thing happen because, as I understand it, you know, the the situation came to you. You in 2004. This other thing that happened didn't happen until like 2009 or 10. Uh, and if I remember right, Jeff, it was a totally unrelated deal where a guy like had a car bombing, and it was it was an attorney, and they went to his house to investigate and that's how this opened up a whole nother investigation and the two were totally unrelated is that is that real so it's pretty complicated but let me do the best i can in about 60 seconds for your audience when i was running in 2004 against carnahan about three weeks before the end of the campaign a guy approached two of my aides and said i want to put out a mailer about carnahan missing tons of votes and barely showing up for work as a state legislator. My mm -hmm. aides came to me and said, should we give him all the information about Carnahan's missed votes? And I said, knowing that there was something a little wrong about coordinating with a third party or an outside group, knowing that it was fishy, instead of saying yes or no, I said, look, just don't tell me any details. And they said, so, what does that mean? Should we give him the voting record? And I said, are you stupid? I don't want to know what you do. So that conversation was probably, you know, a 30 second conversation, but it was very critical because had my aides told that third party, just go to this website and you can get all this information that would have been legal. But by getting him and handing him the voting record, the stuff that we had had compiled, that constituted a legal coordination between a campaign and a third party group that was going to spend some money to try to influence the outcome of the race. 
that's where we broke a law. Uh, and then I broke another law by signing an affidavit after the campaign, after we lost by 1%, but the victor filed a complaint against me uh, with the Federal Election Commission and pursued that complaint. I signed an affidavit saying, I don't know anything about this postcard that came out with information about my opponent's voting record. In reality, I didn't know much about it, but mm -hmm. I knew that my aides had met with the guy who put out a postcard uh, that, 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 that uh, covered the voting record. So five years later, my best friend, my former best friend, uh, who you know, Brent, mm -hmm. came to me and said, hey, the feds knocked on my door. I'm afraid they want to know about that postcard from five years ago. Uh, they were, you know, and so over the course of a couple months, he got me to admit that I had signed a false affidavit. Little did I know that that entire time, my former friend was wearing a wire. Mm. And the way, as you suggested, the way that they got this information was because the dude who had approached my campaign aides five years earlier turned out to be a psycho who mm -hmm. had been a drug dealer. He had car bombed his ex-wife's divorce lawyer and nearly killed the guy and was wanted by the feds for cocaine distribution, heroin distribution, wire fraud, mortgage fraud, bank fraud, and of course, this car bombing. So their search of his condo led to tapes of him talking to my former friend who was then compromised as part of and decided uh, chose to wear a wire on me to avoid um, having to go to prison himself. Wow, that's like a movie. I mean, those are the things you write about in movies that somebody's got a big imagination, and that's that really happened. That's unreal. So, uh, Jeff, when all that happened, when did you know that this clamp was coming on you that you had been had? So one night I was playing basketball with a bunch of guys, and um, I got run off the screen and ran into like a 280 pound dude and it just flattened me and i never been in so much i was knocked unconscious i'd never been in so much pain in my life turned out that i had broken a couple of ribs although i didn't know it then was could not breathe or move couldn't drive home um and got driven home and put in my bed my friend whose wife who had been there uh and seen how much pain i was in his wife had just been pregnant and she had some Percocet, some painkillers. He brought over some painkillers for me. I took a couple of those. I went to sleep. I woke up in the middle of the night in excruciating pain in my chest uh, from breathing and, and took a couple more. And then there was a pounding on my door at six in the morning. And I didn't know if I was hallucinating from the Percocet. I put on some boxer shorts and a t-shirt, walked downstairs, and it was the feds. Oh, wow. And they were not interested in you. We're just interested in this guy, Skip Olson. And we think you may know something about him. He was the guy who had approached my campaign aides five years earlier. And stupidly, I let them in my house and I told them I didn't really know anything about what they were asking. And right there, that after they got my friend, uh, the wiretap that, you know, that, that my friend had worn, they uh, had another count of... Uh, <laughs> of obstruction of justice based on me denying that morning that, uh, that I knew anything about this. So wow. that was when, that was the gut punch. You know, that was actually when I knew that, you know, the feds were hot on my trail, then called my lawyer and my lawyer said, well, what, you know, let me call the assistant U S attorney. And the assistant U S attorney said, Hey, his, his best friend has been wearing a wire the last couple of months. That was really the, the gut punch of the whole thing. Jeff, how did you feel about that? I mean, you guys were really close. So probably, I mean, probably couldn't be any closer as best friends. I mean, what, what does that feel like? You know, it's tough. Uh, it, it makes you question yourself and your judgment. It makes you uh, question the, the ability to trust anyone ever again. Um, obviously, I was furious at myself for making the initial mistake and not telling my aides don't do that. I think there's something fishy about it. You know, I didn't know the finer points of campaign finance law as a first time candidate, but 
again, I knew it was fishy enough to say, hey, don't tell me any details. And I didn't even ask them to look into this guy's background. Yeah. You know, this guy, uh, if we'd have looked more deeply into it, we'd have seen that he was pretty sketchy. Um, and ultimately, by not having them at least vet him, I let my aides deal with this monster because I wanted to win so bad. Right. So obviously, it made me reflect on my mistakes. It made me reflect on my judgment. And it made me um, made it difficult for me to ever trust anybody again. Yeah. You know, I always say, subsequent to that, I always say in politics, never trust anybody but your mama and, and keep one eye on her. <laughs> well, I think there's a lot to that. I mean, my, my situation was it was within my family and, and uh, you know, I, I thought my dad was godlike and trusting him to no end. And when I got down to the end, I felt like there were things I should have known or should have asked and should have delved into. But, you know, trust is a, trust is a big deal. And, and, you know, it does make you question, you know, you know, how you read things, but I think how you handled things is, you know, is really what happens in your life, right? I mean, everybody has their own stuff that happens. It's what you do with that stuff when it does happen. So when you had that happen and your attorney says, Hey, he's been wearing a wire. How long of a period did you have there, Jeff, before you were staring at, I'm going to either going to go to trial or I'm going to do a plea. I mean, how fast did things move for you? So it moved pretty quickly. I mean, over the next several weeks, um, made it, you know, went in and the feds played uh, the most damning moments of the tapes for me. And I said to my lawyer, how bad is this on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the worst? And he mm -hmm. says, uh, you know, two, two and a half. And I said, so, so you think I can beat the charge? And he said, well, you know, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, you know, hey, it's a couple of buddies talking. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some stuff that's not great, but uh, I was like, so you think we should fight it? He's like, well, you know, it's the Eastern District of Missouri. You'll have a couple probably uh, people on the jury from St. Louis City, maybe people who heard about some of the good stuff you've done, you know, in, in as a senator. I think you could probably hang a jury. I think you'd have a good chance. I said, what will it cost? He said, oh, you know, million, million and a half. Obviously, mm. I didn't have that kind of money. I said, what if I, ha what if I am able to hang the jury? He said, no, then they'll come back and try you again. Right. I said, that's another million, million and a half. He said, no, next time it's probably two and a half or three million. I said, why? He said, because they have to spend a, the first, you know, six months is just dealing with all the motions related to the first trial. So, you know, it's, it's going to take much longer the second time. So when it was all said and done, he said, you know, you're probably talking about a four or five million dollar deal if you want to beat him. And I was going up for re-election, so I'd be in the middle of a trial probably during my re-election. The more we thought through it, uh, based on the finances, the odds, the more it just made sense to plead guilty and cut my losses. So you did you know what your plea deal did you Jeff, did you know what because they were interested in me helping them go further up the food chain in the way that Steve had delivered me. Uh, they had a couple very high profile people in Missouri politics who they thought I could deliver to them. Um, but, you know, um, one of those people I didn't think I could possibly help with. Another of those people I didn't was a close friend who hadn't done anything uh, illegal that I knew of. So I wasn't really interested in helping the feds on a fishing expedition against you know someone who I was close to and uh, chose not to wear a wire or anything like that and ultimately um, due to you know in large part to that decision uh, and of course my own mistakes was sentenced to a year and a day in federal prison so you get and you if I remember right in the book you said that you your attorney had suggested to try to get you to go to uh, to Marion which would have been closer but you ended up getting the letter in the mail that said you were going to Kentucky, which yeah, isn't so a, close. Yeah, I went to a place in Southeast Kentucky called uh, FCI Manchester. Um, we were hoping, first we were hoping to avoid a prison sentence. I mean, we put a memo, a sentencing memo into the judge. We had over 300 letters uh, attesting to my character. And we asked if I could just teach high school social studies for two years, coach basketball for free, uh, you know, no salary and be on home confinement. So I could never leave my house except to go to work. Um, that could have saved taxpayers a ton of money. Yeah. 
since yeah. it costs you know a fair amount of money to in incarcerate someone plus it would have been a you know uh you know a two years of a teacher salary you know would it would have saved taxpayers some money so the feds uh, were not persuaded of that logic so I, I did go to prison there's a guideline uh in the federal system that they want to put you as close to home as possible to facilitate contact with loved ones, uh, but always within 500 miles. When we got the sentence, um, the place that I was sentenced to was like actually like 500 miles and like a couple tenths of a mile away from my house. But at that point, uh, I figured I was on a losing streak and, and I wasn't going to double down. So we just accepted yeah. that. And I ended up in Southeast Kentucky in a impoverished uh, Appalachian town. So tell me, Jeff, what the night before prison, because you voluntarily surrendered, I'm assuming, um, what was that like? You know, I was ashamed of what had happened. I had, uh, it was a very public ordeal. I tried to spend time with my family uh, and my then uh, girlfriend, uh, now my wife, um, who stuck with me through it all. I like but, that. Uh, it was difficult. I mean, we went down um, and we spent the night at a cousin's house in Lexington, Kentucky. And yeah. I remember that night pretty well because my aunt Vivian, uh, she was about 85 at that point, almost 90. And she had always had such big dreams and high hopes for me. And coming to grips with the reality of just how many people I had disappointed um was really difficult that's the main thing that stands out to me about the night before i surrendered um when i did surrender i mean there's the moment that uh all of us have been through who have mm -hmm. who have been locked up um that probably is the moment that sticks out the most and that's just seeing the gates clang shut behind you when you walk into the intake center and you know um fortunately i did get to self-surrender uh, as opposed to you know going handcuffed and being in a county jail and being in transit uh you know for days or weeks that would have been even worse but it is a pretty tough feeling seeing you know uh, the person you love drive away after the gates clang shut that's uh kind of a visual that you never get out of your brain no it stays with you and it's it, there's nothing uh, there's nothing like that knowing that you're walking away from everything that you love and the gates are clanging behind, and you're walking into everything that's unknown. And you, you, you're walking into the world that the only way you're going to know about this is to just get into it. And so when you walk us in, Jeff, when you, you get into this Kentucky prison and you get the intake, what's, what's some of your uh, first takeaways when you're there for the first day and getting, getting yourself into this crazy world of prison? Well, so my first the first thing that happened was I walked in and this, uh, uh, this woman says to me, um, she says, you know, name. And I said, you know, Jeff Smith, she says, hot and wait. And I said, five, six, you know, 117. She says, uh, education level. I said, PhD. <laughs> and she kind of raised her eyebrows. Last profession. I said, uh, state Senator. And she looked at me and she said, uh, all right, you want to play games? You can play games all you want. We got ones here that think they're Jesus Christ. <laughs> I love it. So, you know, I uh, went up to the, up the yard, got my assignment. I was in a, they were opening a new uh, wing of the prison. So there was just a small group of us at first and, a bunch of guys were questioning me and one of them said uh you know how long how long you got and i was like well first he was like man this one guy was like what you done did mm -hmm. i'm like lied to the feds and he's like damn how they get you and i was like my best friend wore a wire and they were like <laughs> basically in prison lingo they said well someone needs to deal with him <laughs> uh, and, and yeah i won't go any further but uh <laughs> uh and then one guy said well how long you got and i was like a year and a day and he said damn 
I done more time in this joint on the toilet than you got time. <laughs> he had he had done 25 years nearly uh, for a variety of things. So, you know, on one hand, that made me think like, man, I'm going to hear a lot of interesting shit this year. Yeah. And I want to and I want to write it down. On the other hand, it really was sobering because it made me realize that no matter how bad you have it, other people always have it worse. Yep. I thought I was feeling sorry for myself having to go away for a year. I had the shortest sentence of anybody in that prison. So it made me realize that I actually had it pretty good compared to the people that I would spend my next year around. So Jeff, when you got in there, did you, um, you have it like, cause you, you lived a life to where you always were setting goals and, and you were, you know, running towards those goals. What about in prison? What were your strategies in prison? How did you, how did you tackle that world? When I was in prison, um, I had some setbacks and they turned out to be good things. Uh, they turned out to be blessings and they were blessings in disguise. For example, I was put as a job. I applied to teach. I figured I had over a decade of teaching experience. I'd love to keep my mind stimulated. I'd love to help other guys. I put together three or four different curricula uh, that, that I could have taught courses on black history, courses on politics, a course on financial literacy. Um, they were not interested. The prison was not interested in that. And they put me in the, on the loading dock in the food warehouse. So I spent uh, my weeks catching and throwing, you know, 80 pound boxes and hundred pound bags of rice, beans, flour, sugar, just in a line with six other dudes. At first I thought, man, this is going to be miserable, but you know what? When you go into prison at 117 pounds as one of the only, you know, white collar guys there, it is not a bad thing to become buddies with six <laughs> of the biggest guys on the yard because the other six guys were all, you know, 240 to 350 pounds. So yeah. they became like my crew. And I also got access to some of the only decent food that came into the compound, right? Because once you got back on the yard into the kitchen, there was no decent food left by the time it got the people's food trays, right? <laughs> They'd already between the guys in the warehouse and the guys in the kitchen, you know, it had all been, the decent stuff had been stolen or eaten. So uh, it gave me access to, you know, to some of that. And, um, and thirdly, and, and I think most important, uh, it just, it occupied me 40 hours yeah. a week. I was working my ass off and time is your enemy in prison. I mean, it, it, and that's one of the things I learned. Maybe you can, I'd love to hear your take on this, but like, your entire life, at least for somebody like me, I was in a hurry. Yeah. I was on the move. I wanted to get somewhere. I was 29. I was running for Congress. I already had my PhD. I already had, you know, started a school. I wanted to do more, faster, better, make more change in this world. I wanted to fit more in every day than I possibly could. When I was in the state Senate, you know, I would come back on a Thursday from Jefferson City. I would do seven or eight neighborhood meetings or events that Thursday night, go running from ward to ward, neighborhood meeting, to neighborhood meeting, fundraiser to fundraiser to, to put in, you know, show my face, show everybody that I could be everywhere. Then I got to prison. And the one thing that I had tried to, you know, to extend when I was on the street, I wanted more <laughs> hours in every day. Once you get to prison, everything works in reverse. People are moving slowly because they're trying to extend every activity in their day to fill up the day. That took a lot of getting used to for me. And, and I can't tell you how many times that first month people said to me like, yo, Senator, pump the brakes, man. <laughs> Slow down, walk <clears throat> slower, get the, you know, lift the, the boxes, lift the bags slower, do everything more slowly, just to let this fill more of the day so that the days go by faster. Well, I think that's filling up your days because you and I both worked at the food warehouse. That, you know, is great exercise and, and it did fill your, and we fed, I think 2,200 guys. So it, there's nothing like being busy and having your mind busy 
you know, when you're in that situation. So I so identify with that because that was one of my strategies was not quit being me, try to stay being me and try to find things to busy myself with so that I, I still had an active mind. But I, I know the other thing too, Jeff, that you run into in prison is even if you're trying to do all that, you still have hard days. You know, you, you try to keep, you know, you're, trick, you're tricking your mind every day. You know, I've got to win the day here. i got to do something, keep myself going. How did you handle hard days, tough days, sad days? I wrote. I, I, I took notes on what I was seeing. I took notes on what I was hearing. I wrote letters to people on the outside who had written me. I mean, God bless everyone who writes letters to people who are locked up to help yeah. them, to help sustain them. If I could ask one thing of your audience, if you know anyone who's locked up, write them a letter today. Yeah. Uh, if you don't, then be a volunteer pen pal with, with somebody because that, that helps people uh, you know, just mitigate the, the misery of, of prison life. Yeah, it gives them hope. Yeah, it gives them hope. So, so that's what I did. You know, I took notes on toilet paper. I took notes on napkins from the chow hall. Anywhere I could, I took notes and tried to get exact quotes from people to just so I, you know, so that in case I did write a book someday, I could really have the, uh, I could hear the voices. Yeah, and that was really the authentic. The purpose. And that was really the purpose of the book. I mean, like, I needed it for myself. I'm not going to lie. Like, I needed to turn the page on yeah. that period of my life as a public person, I felt like I needed to not just like try to reinvent myself as something new without grappling with what had been. But I also wrote it, uh, I'd say the biggest reason I wrote it was to try to like humanize people who are locked up in this country yes. and show them in all of their beauty and pain. And yeah. uh, I think I, you know, if I succeeded in anything, succeeded in anything, in the book, Mr. Smith Goes to Prison, it is painting a fuller, more nu nuanced and textured portrait of people who are locked up, uh, who are some of the smartest people that I ever met. And that was what my TED talk was about, is just about the incredible entrepreneurial savvy of the people who I encountered in prison. Everybody had a hustle, you know, cause you couldn't survive on your prison wage. I made $5.25 for a full-time job in prison. That was not an hourly wage. That was a monthly. <laughs> and so if you don't have someone sending you in a hundred bucks a month, 200 bucks a month for your toiletries, you know, your shampoo, your soap, your deodorant, your toothbrush and toothpaste, you got to figure out a hustle, a way to, you know, have some income or, you know, get, get the things you need in prison. And just seeing the different side hustles and businesses that, that people developed inside Man, it just made you think if we could leverage this kind of business savvy in the real world and help people translate it into actual businesses when they get home, man, we could really unleash uh, a, 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 an unbelievable amount of GDP growth in this country. I so I so agree with you, Jeff, on that. I was like you, so incredibly uh, impressed by how resourceful and, and you know you break down a, a somebody who was in the drug world uh they had a product they had to figure out how to sell it they had to figure out layers of uh compensation and commission they had to have incentives distribution all those things and they were they were handling the business they were a ceo of a business it was just happened to be an illegal business but very very smart resourceful people i was i was always thinking the same thing that you're talking about is if, if you just flip it. These people could be incredible entrepreneurs in the business world. It's it. So tell me, so you're there for eight months. Did you get visits because you were so far away? I got visits. Um, visits were wonderful. Um, my, uh, you know, my now wife uh, came to visit me, you know, once a month or so, which was just fantastic. I always look forward to that. I will say one of the worst moments was when my parents came. I kind of wish that that would have never happened because I really didn't want them to see me like that. that those were some difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when my mom, you know, she's like, well, you know, look at you. Cause I gained about, put on about 25 pounds of muscle in the warehouse. She said, look at you. What? Oh my gosh. How did you get <laughs> like this? I said, well, I'm moving, you know, 35,000 pounds of food every day, you know, like, or whatever it was, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, 
you know, Busy. getting stronger. She yeah. said, why? I said, well, I'm working in the warehouse. She said, well, why don't they have you do something like teaching? And I said, well, mom, you know, they, they heard I was like jotting notes down and I may be writing a book. They didn't like that. So they figured they'd wear me out, <laughs> occupy me and put me somewhere where I'd be too tired to write anything. And she just said, well, I can't believe it. You'll never learn your lesson. You're getting in trouble all over again. Oh, and that was a tough conversation. Um, but I tell you what, the, the visits, I'm just thankful for everybody who came to see me, friends, yeah. family. Um, the, I, I felt horrible sometimes that I did get visits because there were other guys that had been locked up for 15 years and hadn't had a visit the whole time. Uh, yeah, that's, so, that, that's one of the really sad things in prison is that, you know, I think we had 435 guys in our population and maybe 30 of them got visits. You know, yeah. And I might be... I'm pretty close to that. I mean, it was, it was sad. And I, and I, I like you, uh, Jeff, I was very, very lucky with a wife that she came all the time and, and the kids and, um, and friends. And I was, you know, that, that's the one, it's the one way to be able to straddle the fence in prison to have your one foot in prison and one foot in the other world that you can connect to the real world out the freedom world and makes a difference. I'm, you know, always thought I was so thankful that I had that because I think, you know, prison time can be so much harder without that. And a lot of guys didn't have that. A lot of guys didn't have their wives, you know, the wives left or, you know, families were broken. And that was one of the tough things you saw in prison is that guys were having to do their time on their own because uh, everything had gone you know, and left to the, to what they, what they had, they didn't have anymore. Uh, to me, those are, those are sad things, but that's, you know, that's part of the prison world and what it does to families and how it breaks them up. But for those who don't have that, that didn't break up, uh, you just, you cherish it that much more. Definitely. So, so Jeff, when you finally get to the point, you're getting close to the door. Now the, you know, state Senator Jeff Smith, entrepreneur running all the time. What are you thinking as you're getting close to the door? I'm getting out. What, what are you going to do? Well, first thing I was thinking was, man, it's going to be nice to have a phone again. <laughs> but you know what I was honestly thinking on a, on a deeper level is, what the fuck am I going to do to make money? Yeah. How am I, like, my livelihood, you know, who's going to hire me to teach? I yeah. can't run for office because of my conviction. What the hell am I going to do? Mm -hmm. I mean, I wrote a business plan to be a, to be a campaign consultant. I wrote a business plan with a friend uh, called Prison Abs to uh, well, I love that. We were deciding between prison abs and convict conditioning uh, <laughs> to start to start a gym um, with all the stuff that I had done to, to get in, you know, good shape. I think there's a guy in New York that did that. There that really is. was successful. <laughs> there is. He, he, I'm friendly with him. His name is Cost okay. Marty, and he is yeah. now on the New York City Council. Wow, it's amazing. He's got a great story. Yeah, he started a gym. Uh, up there and and uh, he's a, he's fantastic so you know I thought through a bunch of different options and ultimately I interviewed for a job I mean you know uh, consulting for a small affordable housing nonprofit and at the end of the interview the woman who's the vice chair of the board she said to me look my question for you is with your background you know why shouldn't we hire someone else and then maybe in a year or so, hire you away from wherever you're working after some of the aroma has begun to wear off. Wow. So if you think about that, I mean, like when I came out of prison, I had advantages that 99.9% .9 of people coming out of prison don't have in this country. I had a great education from a great university. I had family support. I had enough money to live on. I had a home to go home to. I'm white. And that was the question I got in an interview. Why shouldn't we let someone else hire you and take you for a year while the aroma wears off? If it was that hard for me, think of what it's like for people that don't have all the advantages that I had coming home. And that's why you know we should all, whether you own a business and you could hire someone and give them a second chance, whether you own property and you could rent an apartment to someone who needs a second chance, I just encourage people to try to help folks get back on their feet because 
if you come out of prison, you've got the felony conviction, you've got the added stigma of, of, of that conviction that makes it harder to find a job or access like public programs like food stamps, find a place to live. You know, we're putting people behind the eight ball who already have struggled in life, uh, making it even harder to succeed when they come home. So, you know, I encourage everybody out there to just uh, consider ways that you can give people a second chance. If you want to be a part of something like that, I help lead an effort in St. Louis based out of St. Louis University called the Transformative Workforce Academy that connects people with convictions to second chance employment. If you got a company and you're willing to hire somebody, please just, you know, shoot me a note at jeff.smith at slu.edu. Or, you know, if you want to donate, you can go online to second chance uh, or slu.edu slash second chance. Uh, and you could donate to, to help us. We've recruited over a hundred companies in the St. Louis region that are participating, uh, but we always need more. And if you're somebody who needs a second chance yourself, go to that website and, and we'll get you hooked up. I love that, Jeff. That's, that's the kind of stuff, what you just said, that will make a difference. That's the stuff that makes a difference is actually putting something to work, some, something tangible that people can grab onto. Because here's the thing about guys that get out of prison. I'm not talking about the guys that are hurting people. And, you know, the, the, I'm talking about guys that just are trying to find their way. They made a mistake. They want to get back into society. And these, these, percentages that you have that are two thirds go back in, in three years and three fourths go back in five years. A lot of it is, is they just can't get back in because nobody wants, like you're saying, the aroma. And these people are good. They're good employees because they want it. They're, they're passionate about wanting to stay out. They want to be part of society. They're just looking for an opportunity. And that's, uh, you know, once you're in prison, you feel that to your bones. You know that. And you've been with the guys that, that you know, that are looking and they want to stay out. They want to be a part of everything going forward. And it's it's that what you're talking about there, Jeff. Those are the type of things that make a difference. And if we could connect all that across the United States into some big network, um, it would make a difference. I like it. It's good stuff. So, Jeff, what are you doing now? So I do a bunch of different things, but um, first of all, that uh, that little nonprofit that that uh, interviewed me over a decade ago, um, I'm now uh, executive director of that nonprofit, and uh, we've grown um, about tenfold in membership uh, and revenue since uh, since I interviewed with them long ago. So that's called Love the Missouri it. Workforce Housing Association, and we fight for um, federal, state, and local programs that. Uh, foster the construction and rehabilitation of decent, affordable housing uh, for people who are struggling a little bit um, or making low wages. I also help with the Transformative Workforce Academy on the Second Chance Employment side. Um, I lobby for a nonprofit called Appleseed, which uh, helps fight for better conditions for people who are incarcerated. As part of that, last year, we were able to pass legislation requiring that all incarcerated women in the state of Missouri have free access to feminine hygiene products, which many did not. And this year we're working on a bill to uh, uh, require the Department of Corrections to build a nursery uh, at our women's prison in Vandalia so that women who are incarcerated uh, and deliver babies do not immediately lose their babies to foster care and lose their parental rights. Um, this way they could stay in a repurposed wing of the prison with their child uh, for almost two years and then walk out of prison alongside them and have a new purpose in life. So that's awesome. Yeah. So I'm really excited about, about that. And, you know, I do other, uh, I also chair the oversight board um, that advises our county jails leadership in St. Louis County. So that gives me another way to try to, you know, give back a little bit um, uh, and try to, you know. Yeah, give somebody that's a voice that knows from the inside out. Yeah, I love exactly. that. Well, Jeff, what I, I got to say this. Your, your story is really inspiring for not just people who went to prison, but just people who think, you know, standing and thinking that they've got potential and they're afraid to take a step. 
And, you know, anything you do in life, you've got to take action. And, and I think your life uh, tells that story. You've, you've taken action. You've, you've gone into things. Nothing's too big. Uh, you, there's a challenge that's not too small you, you're, or not too big. You, you just walk in, into it. And I think for anybody listening to this today, that's, that's how things happen. You just have to step into it. And the unknown is the scariest thing, but whatever, whatever you want is probably on the other side of that, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, things can look really daunting when you start a huge project. But yeah, just making a little bit of progress every day, whether it's writing a book or running a marathon or trying to get a bill passed. Yeah. And, and I think the other thing that we find out, especially when you've gone through dealing with your worst fear becoming your reality is, is that nothing is ever as bad as your mind makes it out to be. You're Even exactly prison. right, Brent. You're Even exactly prison. Exactly right. I mean, you know what? You, you go into, you watch prison movies, you see Shawshank Redemption, and you see the, the nasty side of prison life. But, you know, I met a lot of wonderful people in prison. I met people that I would trust my children with, that I would yeah. trust my bank account with. I met people who I had agreements with that always held up their end of the bargain and more. And um, I would tell you that, uh, you know, there are things you can learn from anybody and anything you do. I learned a ton from people that I met in prison about character, about entrepreneurship, um, about life and, uh, and about friendship. And, um, even though it was a shitty year in my life, um, there are there's a lot that you can take away from even the tough times. What do you think, Jeff? You know, being in prison and and you know, because I think everybody's had a little taste of prison in this pandemic, and and they've had things. You know, you can't go where you want, can't do what you want, you got to wear a mask, you do all these things. A little, you know, a little taste of prison. What do you think you appreciate the most now, having the perspective, looking at being in prison and being home and having freedom? Steak. <laughs> steak. I love it. There's no steak in prison. No, nah, there's there's stuff called loaf, which is like meatloaf in te- <laughs> it's like meatloaf in texture, except it doesn't have any actual meat in it. Um yeah. so no, I mean I, I kid, but I am serious. I mean, God, I appreciate every meal that I make uh these days, um, even a decade later. But you know, most of all, I appreciate my friends. I appreciate my family. I appreciate my wife. I appreciate the people who stood by me in the darkest times because, yeah. um, you know, there is uh, no way to get through this thing intact, you know, to get through prison intact if you don't have some people in your life uh, around you who can help sustain you. So, you know, I, um, the people who stood with me, the 300 people who wrote a letter to the judge on my behalf, if they called me and asked me for any favor, you know, there's almost nothing I wouldn't do for them. Uh, that yeah. doesn't involve some, a crime that, that could leave me back in prison, but um, <laughs> for, for real, uh, just that kind of loyalty that, that people had to me um, when I was down, that's the thing I appreciate most. And just gratitude for freedom. Yeah. I'll, I'll leave you with this. Uh, and I think I tell the story in the book. When I got to New York um, after prison, I ended up getting a job as a professor for a while. And I was in New York and I just got married and had a baby. And it was one of those really cold, crappy, rainy New York City days. Mm -hmm. And I was riding my bike to work and I was riding my bike in the city and some idiot tourist got out of the cab on the street side instead of the curb side causing me to swerve and fall off my bike and nearly, you know, get hit by a a car. And as I was getting up, I started to curse at the tourist who was getting out of the cab. And then all of a sudden I had this like epiphany and I'm not a particularly religious person, but it was like a revelation coming over me. And I just thought about the year in which I couldn't ride a bike. I couldn't feel the rain in my face. And I certainly couldn't teach at a great university, you know, smart kids and and make money and 
and have the opportunity that I had in New York. And I just felt this overwhelming sense of gratitude for just the freedom to be able to ride my bike and, and feel that rain on my face. And instead of cursing the guy out, I just felt so blessed that when I finished teaching that day, I would be able to go home to my newborn baby boy and my wife. And um, that's what I'll say was my biggest takeaway from the whole experience is just gratitude. Love it. I love it. That's a great way to leave it, Jeff. I love it. That's awesome. And that's gratitude. And the way you just explained it is nothing better. Nothing better. Hey, for everybody, Jeff Smith's book, Mr. Smith Goes to Prison. Uh, it's a great book. I just reread a little bit of it. I read it two or three years ago when I got out of prison. And, and uh, I just it's a great book for a lot of different reasons. It's a great story, but he's also got just good nuggets of information in there about our system. Jeff, thanks so much um, for being on. I appreciate you taking the time. Hope you get to where you're going, where, you're, where you are going in the car. So really appreciate it. Really you're, appreciate you're it. You're welcome, Brad. Thank, thank you for having me on. Thanks for, for, uh, for doing this podcast. I love the theme of, you know, nightmare success. You can, you can think you're at the top, you know, but you can get cut down pretty quickly. And humility is something that, uh, that I think all of us can use a little bit more of. So thanks, thanks again. And, uh, and great to visit with you. Nightmare success in and out, folks. Thanks for listening. Take care.